in the room, so please stand by on that. Apologize for technical difficulties we've had this morning. We're trying to do this both uh, in person and online. We've had some difficulties with the classroom. But, um, in any event, uh, welcome. Uh, again, my name is Derek DeRazio. Uh, I am the Grants Branch Manager and Compliance Officer at North Carolina Emergency Management. Uh, my branch that I run um, runs this grant that we're talking about today. Um, it's the FY22 SLTGP State Local Cyber Security Grant Program. So uh, this training series in particular is intended for sub-recipients of the FY22 SLCGP grant. Now, anybody can participate, uh, but you, you'll get most value out of it if you are an actual sub-recipient of this grant. Okay, this is part of an ongoing training series that we have called GEICO, Get Your Grant On. Um, so we talk about different grants at different times, different training programs that we have. Today is SLCGP. This afternoon, we're talking about a grant program called Nonprofit Security Grant Program. It's a different program. So. Uh, all told, uh, my office, we run about 10 different federal state grant programs. Um, roughly $90 million a year is our portfolio um, that we run. Uh, and this is one grant of those 10 grant programs that we run. FY22 SLCGP, you're looking at about $5 million for FY22. So we do about $80, $90 million, about $5 million. So this is one of the many response stories that we have. Um, for SLCGP, the 23 grant program, and we get this right up right out front because the question always comes up. For FY23 SLCGP, um, the state of North Carolina was allocated a little over $10 million. So we doubled our award for 22. Um, we are going to start soliciting self recipient applications, if all goes well, in December. Um, so if you stay tuned to our SLCGP website, and we'll get information out when we start soliciting uh, self recipients for that. Um, so we'll, we will, it's doubling the money that we have. Um, currently, with the 22 program, as you know, there was a, a cap of $100,000 on the award that you could apply for. We're probably going to at least double that cap in 23, since we have double the money, so it'll probably be a $200,000 cap, if not higher. Than well, we're here today to talk about the 22 program. Um, so before we do that, we're going to start with some introductions. Uh, again, my name is Derek Delasio. Um, I've been with NCEM uh, since 2021, started as a compliance officer, then picked up uh, no more responsibility joining the grants management branch. Um, and at NCEM, um, we have what we call preparedness grants, um, and those are things that do not require a disaster declaration. Um, so as I mentioned, SLCGP, uh, the Nonprofit Security Grant Program, Emergency Management Performance Grant Program, Competitive, uh, competitive Capacity Building Grant Program, State Grant Program, CBCG, um, Homeland Security Grant Program, Alphabet Suit goes on. They do not require a disaster declaration. They're designed to prepare the all in the event we do have a disaster or an incident, these are grants to prepare you for that. Um, flip the switch, if we actually have a disaster, a disaster declaration is issued, we have different grants that NCM offers. Public assistance is the biggest one, and it has a mitigation grant program as well. They require disaster declarations. Um, all told in NCEM, if you look at our total portfolio of grants, we do about $500 million a year between disaster and non-disaster grants. Um, all told in our organization, we have over 20 major recurring federal and state grant programs. My office branch, manager branch, we run 10 programs where we're roughly $80, $90 million a year. So do the math, we run the most number of grant programs, but the big money's in disasters, right? We do about $80, $90 million of $500 million portfolio. So most of the money's in public assistance, natural mitigation, uh, but we run the most number of grant programs. Um, so we're called the grant management branch. So we don't do, we do anything with disaster declaration grants, just um, non-disaster preparedness grants. All right. Um, so that's what we do. That's what I do. We're going to go around the room now and start with our team and introduce ourselves. Okay. And we're going to go around to the audience. You can introduce yourselves as well, online and in person. Um, so um, we'll start with our team. And when we go around to the audience, um, I'll call on the folks online, but in, in the room, we'll just go around first. Um, you're going to just give your name, your organization, your role with the organization. Um, your experience you have with grants. Would you bring a copy or do you have access to a copy of your 20 FY22 SLC GP MLA? Any specific questions we'd like to cover today? We have plenty of time today to answer all of our questions. Okay. But first, we'll start with our team that you got. And so I introduce myself. Brad, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. My name is Bradley Garrett. I am a grants administrator and the grants branch, uh, grants management branch. Uh, Personally, I handle the NSGP grant and several other state grants, OAD, uh, NC211, also uh, GCC. Uh, recently, I was brought in to handle the Eastern branch. Uh, I've been working in grants branch ever since uh, 2021. Uh, my experience with grants, I started working with grants during COVID back home in Buffalo, New York. 
And then when I moved down here, I was hired by NCD uh, Black on emergency management. Well, thank you, Brandon. Um, Gene, are you ready to introduce yourself? Or are you still working on getting the invite set? Okay. Gene, the very good person today. All right. Um, I think we have some of our team online today. Um, Michelle Strong, you want to go introduce yourself, please? Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Strong. I am the newest uh, member. Stand, stand by, Michelle. I'm sorry. Stand by, please. Stand by real quick. Our speaker is going to hear all. Stand by. Okay. Okay, Michelle. Uh, can you go ahead and introduce yourself again? Okay, you can hear me, right? All good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Strong. I'm the newest member um, on this team. Um, I work with all of the central uh, branch grants. Um, prior to this, my background is mostly in nonprofit work, dealing mostly with HUD grants. Um, but prior to this, I did work with NCOR for uh, a few years. And so um, here I am. Great. Right, thank you, Michelle. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, Lisa Patton, are you online? Do you want to introduce yourself, please? Good morning. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Lisa Patton. I've been with North Carolina Emergency Management since 2012. Uh, my role is a grants manager uh, for the majority of our DHS grants, which include the Homeland Security Grant, as well as the Emergency Management Performance Grant. I mostly manage the portfolio in the Western Branch, uh, but we do all share responsibilities for state agency grants um, across North Carolina. Um, again, my prior experience has all been public service. I uh, don't wanna go that far back since 1991 with EMS, law enforcement and fire rescue. Um, and uh, because of that and an internship that I worked at the local level, I recognized uh, needs at the local level. So it better helps us to uh, understand your needs and how we can assist you with these grants. Um, again, my experience with the grants in particular has been since 2012 with the grants team. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Janine, you ready to introduce yourself? Or you want to share? Yeah. Sure. Good morning. My name is Janine Charles. Um, actually, I think I'm the newest member of the show. Um, I've been with the team since 2022. I work on federal and state target. Janine, I'm sorry. Don't worry. Did you mute your, your speakers on your mic? Then you, yeah. You might get some, uh, some feedback here. Can you hear me? Okay. So I primarily work um, with state grants. I work with the capacity building and competitive grant program, CBCG. I also um, work with MPG, that's my newest grant, and I am in to Brand in the Eastern Branch. So I assist him with all of the Eastern Branch counties and our suite of uh, preparedness grants. So thank you so much. Glad you all could make it. Has everyone who's in the room received an invite yet? <laughs> You sent mine to me early, so I shared with these two. Okay. Oh, well, that was nice. <laughs> so, we have a Okay. What's your name, sir? Uh, Steve Bennett. Oh, that's what I'm working on. Okay. I have a so Okay. What's your name? Marcia Rhodes. All right. So, so, for those online, did you hear Janine? And I think Kendra Bradley. For those that are online, can you give me a thumbs up if you heard what Janine said. Kendra Bradley. Kendra Bradley. Kendra Bradley. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm actually working fine. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so we're going to go and do our, our group introductions now. Okay, we'll start with the folks in the room. Uh, so um, we just asked you, we'll start with you, ma'am, since you're just first. <laughs> in, in, in the uh, so if you can say again, just, just please give your name, your organization, your role with the organization, um, your experience, if any, with grants. Did you bring a copy of your MOA with you? And any specific questions you'd like to address? Uh, my name is Jasmine Baggin. I'm with Craven County Government. I'm the administrative assistant. And this is the first time I've done anything with a grant. Outstanding. You're in the right place to learn about this grant. Thank you, Jess. All right. Um, yes, sir. Steve Bennett, uh, Craven County. I'm the IT director. Uh, and 
I've worked with a couple of different grants uh, with Homeland Security, 911 grants. All right, Ashley. Any specific questions y'all want us to address today? Just how do we get reimbursed? All right. Go ahead. I'm Kendra Bradley. I'm the grants manager for LMS Community College. I've been in um, grants for almost two years now uh, with LMS Community College. Uh, we do a lot of grants. So that part I have figured out pretty much. Obviously, each one is specific. Uh, I am no knowledge of IT, though, so likely our IT director is online. <laughs> All right. Oh, Lee is our thank you. Any specific questions you want us to address that? Right, thank he, you. he got the same one. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, Jeff, sir. Uh, my name is Donald Beck, and I'm the director of IT at Davidson Davy Community College. <clears throat> um, experience with grants has mostly been um, grants that um, others have submitted for, and, and IT has been part of those projects, but um, this is probably the first one I think that I've submitted um, for the college. So. Um, and I do have a copy of the MOV, and I don't really have any specific questions, just being the first grant that I've been involved with directly, um, I'm just here to learn what I can. I'll send. All right, you're in the right place. Matt? I'm Amy Kepley. I'm also with Davis and Davey. I'm in the business office, so I actually manage our grants. I've done that for about 10 years. So my questions include reporting requirements, um, closeouts, Billing requirements, timely requirements, those kinds of questions. Glad you're here because we're going to discuss that. And do the right first thing. All the great question. Right. I assume y'all do have a copy or access to your MOA. Yes, we've got electronic. Perfect. Thank you. Joel Hartley, uh, CIO for Davidson County. And this is my first direct experience with a grant. And to my knowledge, we have not received our MOA. You have not? Okay. Davidson County. All right, I'll ask some of my staff if you can, Michelle, maybe look into that and see if the MOA went out. Um, Davidson County. Do you remember recall receiving an award notification? We do have the notification. We have submitted our documents. Okay. All right, but you've not received an MOA yet. Okay. If you can look into that, Michelle, please, I appreciate it. Right, thanks. Sir. Yes, I'm checking right now. All right, thank you. I don't know who, if it would have came to me or the manager. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll plan it for you. We set it too. And just background on this: for 22 SFCGP, we had roughly 70 subrecipients. Uh, so it's possible most of the paperwork got slipped through the cracks, but we'll check on that for you. All right. This uh, is John Gallimore. I'm with Davie County CTO. Um, no experience. Well, I've got experience helping uh, write one grant uh, that we received at the county level, and then no experience directly involved with managing a grant. Okay. Same questions that have already been asked uh, in terms of reporting and uh, what, you know, what the uh, reimbursement process looks like. I'll say it. All right, then, sir. Yes, ma'am. My question is, do you guys know Steph Curry? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, big fan. Um, I'm Marcia Rose. I work for the city of Hickory. Um, I am the project manager mainly right now for the IT department, but it's kind of morphing in for the project management for the city. Um, I have a background in project management for mainly with schools and districts on security, access control, attendance, um, you know, the whole nine yards, everything to do with um, with students and security, safety of the school, you know, that type thing. So I don't have a, a government background per se. So this is kind of new for me. I've only been there um, probably about two months now. So I'm brand new to the government side of things. Uh, so I'm, I'm finding it very interesting, um, really enjoying what I'm doing. Um, I do not have a background per se in writing grants, but I've worked with a lot of obviously dis school districts and their grants and how we fit into those type of things. So the questions that the group has been asking, you know, obviously those are, you know, top on our list. Um, we have an amazing IT director and he is so, um, so detailed and covered in exactly our vision, total redo of the infrastructure for the city of Hickory. So he has this vision, he's already started with it, you know. And so, so I think 
Um, I've, I've highlighted a few things. I actually have a copy of it, yes. Um, I've highlighted a few things just simply because I think what you guys um, have outlined, you know, is pretty well cut and dry, but there are some things I want to make sure. sure that we're doing that we're supposed to be doing, just like all of us. Uh, I'll say I appreciate that. And yeah, and, and just before we get to the rest of the introductions, you know, this, this MLA, our grand agreement is 17 pages long. Uh, it's a legal list of documents and contract rights. So a lot of this stuff is in here just in case something would happen or eventually comes up, kind of a, kind of see what anything, you know, for us and you. But what you really need to know in this, we'll, we'll point out, you know, for your daily manager again, what's really important is you boil it down to really a couple of pages. That's the most important thing to this. Um, but if you've read your agreement, um, appreciate that. You're, you're well ahead of a lot of our other grantees are going to read that away. All you do is go to our last page and sign it. So if you've all read it and you have specific questions, your highlights on it, I appreciate that. But a lot of folks don't take time to read the whole thing. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Derek? Yes, ma'am. Um, I looked into the uh, MOA for Davidson County. Yeah. Um, it looks like it was sent to Fred McClure on September 12th. Most likely he never got it. Okay. Or, or if he did, he deleted it. Okay. <laughs> if they can send it to me. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And, and, and you reach your real name. Is it Donald Beck? Sir? No. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Joel Hartley. Joel Hartley. Jo Joel Hartley. Uh, so we can get Joel Hartley uh, to copy that. Okay. And it, well, it, it comes in DocuSign, so that's, that's how it's electronic. And, it, and it may have gone to spam for Fred. Maybe that's why he didn't see it. Okay. Do you have Joel's email address to put it in DocuSign? I believe I do somewhere. Yeah, I think okay. I do. Yeah. Okay. Hey, oh, Joel, are you, are you on the team site yet? Yes, I am. Do me a favor in, in the chat, drop your name and your email address in there in the chat. So, Michelle, I've got DocuSign today for you. Put it in the chat for you as well, Michelle. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for taking care of that. Okay, we're going to go around the horn online now, and I'm just going to go right from the top of the list down, which I think is kind of alphabetical almost. So, uh, Amy, it's a guest, whatever, whatever your last name is, Amy, you're showing first on the list. Yeah, I'm um, okay. So, if you go ahead. Oh, 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 that's you. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Amy's already here. I'm sorry. All right. Um, uh, is it uh, Sanford? Uh, San Sanford Chancellor, are you online? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanford Chancellor. I'm Chief Operating Officer at the State Board of Elections. We are actually a sub-recipient. Um, so um, Mecklenburg County is the uh, main recipient, uh, County Board of Elections. So I am fairly new to grants and this role. So I'm excited to learn a lot of things. Um, and I do have questions specifically to, uh, as we've turned in the application, if we notice adjustments to the amounts of costs, what does that look like? Because we want to make sure we're in compliance. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, and real quick on that, sir, and we'll get into this, but basically what you applied for in the project and budget you submitted, um, that's what you competed on, right? So that's what you were awarded. Um, we do allow modifications, kind of minor scope modifications. Um, can't change the nature of the project, but can do minor scope modifications. So if some things in the budget shift, that's fine. But if your project you competed on, was to do um, multi-factor authentication, and now you want to go ahead and buy a bunch of computers, right? Change it completely. That's kind of a bait and switch, right? So we don't allow those major scope modification changes, but minor modifications, different types of equipment, adjustments to the budget. We have a process for that to make those modifications, and really, it's as simple as if that comes up, you send us an email uh, with your request in it, and then we would just go ahead and uh, depending on how the detailed request was. Have you modify your, your application, amend it, or move it. Um, so that's kind of what we do on modification. So it's a pretty simple process. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. All right. Um, so nice to meet you, sir, virtually. And uh, we'll move on now to, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's Chanel, uh, Chanel, Chanel Butler. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanel Butler Morello. I work for Catawba Valley Community College. Um, my title is Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. However, I also um, am the main grant administrator for the college. Um, I've been working with federal and state grants for about 12 years. And yes, I have a copy of our MOA in my possession. I'll say thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Are any specific questions you have, Chanel, or just here, just in general, to work? <clears throat> Um, the only questions I would have would be, I think what people keep repeating is just yeah. understanding the reimbursement process, understanding the specific timeline. 
right. um, the process of getting reimbursed? And also, are we allowed to request advancements or is it reimbursement only? Yeah, I'll answer that last question first. Uh, reimbursement only. Um, we don't do any advancement grants at all. All of our grants are reimbursement only, uh, including this one. So, and, okay. and that's. And that's just across the board policy we have, and that's the way I'm also my other hat's compliance officer, so I'm grants management compliance officer. And it's the way we basically enforce compliance um, and making all our grants reimbursement request basis because if there's a problem with an expenditure, you just don't get paid for it. Right? It has to be an eligible expenditure to get paid, and that eliminates 99% of our compliance questions. So all of our grants are reimbursement based. We don't do any advances. <clears throat> no problem. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, I think we have Conrad uh, Singh. Conrad Singh, is that? Conrad, are you, are you online? <clears throat> okay, we'll move, we'll move past Conrad. Um, Crystal Huffman, Crystal Huffman. Uh, yes, I'm Crystal Huffman. I am with Wilkes Community College. I'm the Director of Financial Services, and I do have a copy of our MOA available. Outstanding. Any specific questions you, you want to answer today? No. I'm uh, just here for general information and knowledge at this point. All right, thank you, ma'am. Nice to meet you virtually. Um, all right, Daniel uh, Clanton is next. Daniel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Clanton. I'm the Vice President of Technology and Innovation here at Cloud Valley Community College. It's my first grant. Uh, although I've helped and assisted with other grants with the institution, work with uh, Dr. Morello, and I rely on her for questions. Thank you, sir. Nice to meet you virtually. Thank you. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, Debbie White. Debbie. Hey, I'm Debbie White. I'm with Wilson Community College. I'm the controller. Um, I do have a copy of our MOA, and um, I'm just here to get information. All right. Thank you, Ben. Nice to meet you. Uh, glad you're with us. All right. Donald, I know you're here in the room. Donald Black, so you don't need to introduce yourself again. Uh, Emily Sis. Emily? <clears throat> Good morning, Emily Sisk. I'm the director of grants at Cleveland Community College and just here for information. Uh, we've seen the MOA. Uh, it's not fully signed, but partially signed. So we're aware of the terms and conditions there. So just here for general information. All right, Emily, nice to meet you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jennifer Jones. I'm Jennifer Jones. I am the Director of Information Services and Chief Information Officer at Alamance Community College. Um, I believe Kendra is there um, with you all. She's our grants director. And um, so just interested in learning more. I believe we have signed all of our the docu on in the MOU, so we're just kind of getting information. All right, outstanding. Thank you. And yeah, and just with folks talking about signing things, so there was an award notification that went out um, announcing that you got your award. You were supposed to turn in some names to us. We wanted to sign your MOA grant agreement. Um, the MOA grant agreement went out to DocuSign as well. So hopefully most of those are signed by now. And there was also five required documents you were required to provide to us as well, including a W-9 tax form and electronic vendor payment form. Uh, we're going to cover this in more detail, but that's all you've had to submit so far. So we've done the word notification, the MOA, and the five required documents. Um, okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, moving on, uh, Ms. Jessica, Jessica Jones. Hi, my name is Jessica Jones. Um, I am the Vice President of Finance Administrative Services here at Wilson Community College. Um, my role as a CFO is to oversee uh, funding that comes into the college. I have years of experience with grants, whether it, um, federal, state, local grants. Um, anyone on the line that understands her funding, <laughs> you understand mm -hmm. the impact of having to oversee that part as well. So um, yes, I have a copy of our MOA. I have started going through reading it. I think I got through page 15, I haven't finished, but it's very, wow. w very well written document. I think people have complimented you on that. Um, yes. Pretty much self-explanatory, what I can see from having history with, with um, documents. I don't have any specific questions right now, um, but I'm just here to listen and make sure I'm understanding what I have read so far. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you reading that document. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, John, I know you're in the room. John Gallimore. Yes. Yeah, you're here already. All right. Joel, you're in the room as well. I guess so. Yeah. All right. We got you. Okay. Um, Jonathan Davis. Mr. Davis. Hello, Jonathan Davis uh, with Cleveland Community College. Uh, I'm the Vice President for Technology and Campus Safety, Security, and CIO. 
Um, I have uh, a few years of experience with grants, including Department of Labor TACT grant, National Science Foundation, as well as working with other departments and individuals on, on their respective grants, along with Emily Sisk, who's introduced herself. Um, we do have a copy of our MOA, again, partially signed, and just here for information today. Thank you, sir, Mr. Beecham. All right, um, Jonathan McLeod, Mr. McLeod. Yes, I'm Jonathan McLeod, the Director of IT Infrastructure at Sand Hills Community College. Uh, first grant I've worked on, uh, we have our MOA and just here to learn. I'll say thanks, sir. Nice to meet you. Uh, Carol uh, Orlan. Carol. Hello, my name is Carol Oriana. I'm with the city of Jacksonville. I'm the grants technician and it's my first first year working, so I'm pretty new at this. And this will be the first grant that I'll be responsible for. And I do have a copy of the MOA and as of questions so far, we're just interested to learn the procedure for the reimbursement request, any documents that are required. And we would also like to know if we'd have to report the serial numbers on our purchases. OK, great questions. And is this your first grant? You picked a good one, so I'm glad we're your first here. Um, yeah, on the serial numbers on your purchases. So if you do buy equipment, it's covered in the MOA, but if you buy equipment with the grant, you're required to have an inventory of the grant yourselves. Uh, we don't necessarily request the serial numbers from you. It has to be available in the event of an audit or that we do do request to see them at some point, but we don't turn them in. So it's just to be available on demand. So you inventory it um, and then it's available if we ask for it, uh, either during the grant or during the post -time. Yeah, you do respond to the inventory yourself. Then. Thank you so you, much. Yeah, we'll get to the rest of your questions later. Thank you, Carol. Well, nice to meet you. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Land, Christopher Land, I believe you're next, sir. Christopher? All right, maybe he stepped away. Uh, Derek, Derek, yes. Chris, Christopher Land has put his information in the chat as well as okay. Conrad saying. Oh, they have, okay. All right. All right. The, the, the strong silent text. <laughs> chat in one talk. All right, no problem. All right, um, Mr. Montrose, Lee Montrose. <clears throat> Lee, are you there? All right. Uh, Miss Rose, Marsha Rose. I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry, my, my mic was muted. I didn't realize. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm the CIO at Richmond Community College. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Any specific questions you have for us? Sir? I'm just looking for tips on managing the grant. All right. And Marsha, you're here, right? I'm here. All right. Yeah. All right. Michael Wingler. Mr. Wingler. Hey, I'm Michael Wingler, I'm Vice President of IT and Operations and serve as a CIO for Wilkes Community College. I do have my MOA and I'm like the majority here just trying to get some additional information on how to proceed. All right, outstanding, sir. Thank you, nice to meet you. Uh, Paul uh, Mosky, Paul, please. Paul, I get online. All right, move forward. Uh, Paul's information is also in the chat. All right, another person with the information chat. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Peter, 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 Peter. Good morning. Yes, um, Peter Meehawk, Alamance County Grant Administrator. Um, and, uh, currently administrating an EPA Brownfields Assessment Grant, and I also take care of all the ARPA projects and reporting for the county. And I have experience with. FEMA's 406 hazard mitigation proposal, their 404 hazard mitigation grant program. Um, I have a copy of the MOA on my desktop and no questions at this time. All right, thank you, sir. Nice to meet you. Um, Cheryl Smith. Cheryl. Good morning. I actually go by Kelly. I just have to confuse everybody by my <laughs> email tag. Um, I am the grant writer for Malin Community College, and I am taking massive notes for our IT and finance individuals who could not make it to today's meeting. They had the prior obligations. I do not have a copy of our MOA. I did receive our grant award notification and submitted the documentation, but I have not seen the MOA. 
Okay. And what organization were you with again, ma'am? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Mayland Community College. And that's my um, assignment. So I will check on that for you, Kelly. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. The uh, other okay. questions that I have are just yeah. related to reporting and um, reimbursement. Sam? Thank All you right. so much. All right, thank you. And, and uh, Lisa, thanks. We'll, we'll try to get you that. And my wife, you don't have it. We'll try to get that to you. All right, um, Steve, I know you're here. Um, so we've already covered you. Um, I think we have um, Tanisha. Tanisha Rhymes. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yes, my name is Tanisha uh, Rhymes. I am the IT manager for uh, Robinson County. Um, have zero experience with grants. This is our first one um, receiving. Don't really have any questions. We do have a copy of our MOA and it has been signed. I'll stand. All right. And, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, if this is your first grant, again, I think you picked a good one, and we're going to certainly, you know, we'll certainly make sure you know what you're doing before you leave the presentation today. So thank you. Um, all right, I think we have a maybe a guest online. Just somebody in the room, maybe. Uh, did Wilson we miss? College. Yeah. Okay. So this is Susan Weekly from Wilson Community College. I'm the AVP CIO of IT. Um, and I have zero experience with grants. We do have a copy of our MOA, and I'm just here to listen and learn. All right, I'll send, and then we'll make sure you know everything you need to know about this grant. All right, is there anybody else that we missed online? All right, great. Well, we have a very collective bunch of folks here, which is outstanding from all across the state. And I think we have a pretty good idea of what we're going to cover today. So thank you for all that important information. Um, Brad, next slide, please. Okay, so I think we've already talked about this, but this is part of the Get Your Grant on Training series. Um, we've done different trainings throughout throughout the state and throughout the year. Our next training is going to be at the 2023 NCMA Fall Conference in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is in the middle of October. Um, NCMA is North Carolina Emergency Management Association. Um, so we're doing, we're doing a presentation there, and that presentation is going to be on um, generically competitive grants. Um, and, and how to um, uh, maybe present a more competitive application in some of our competitive grant programs. Um, so we're talking about that. Then we have some follow-on workshops there after the conference on some grant programs. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can just Google NCMA or G and get you the information. That's our next, next series. All right, um, we already covered our portfolio of grants that we talked about earlier. Uh, again, um, if you go to our website, you just Google NCEM grants, uh, you will see all the information about our entire portfolio of grants on there. There's a link on the right side of the page for portfolio of grants. You'll see all the 20 grants I was talking about, along with the amounts and, and some of the specifics on each grant program. Okay, so. Derek, um, I yes, apologize if I may take a minute. Kelly, if you'll put your email address in the chat, I will send you that MOA. It's currently in the DocuSign signature process. Okay. And Lisa, can you do me a favor? Can you go ahead and put, post a link to our portfolio of grants? To that, to that, uh, that website. I can. Yeah, you can put that link on there for everybody to see. And that, that, that is the only ball grants that we have through NCM. All right, so um, we're going to start with a brief introduction of the grant life cycle. Okay, and this is a grant life cycle for a federal grant, which SLCGP is a federal grant. Okay? Um, so with a federal grant, um, specifically federal grants through DHS slash FEMA, that's where we get our money from. NCEM, which I'm going to see management, is the pass-through entity for the federal grant. Okay, so FEMA, DHS will publish a notice of funding opportunity um, on in the federal register. Um, we'll get that notice of funding opportunity. We'll look at it, um, and we, as a state, will then apply. Okay, so with SLCGP, you see the FEMA NOFA. Okay, some people get confused. Local governments think they're supposed to apply directly to FEMA. No, they're not allowed to do that. Okay, only the states and territories can apply to FEMA. So we submit an application on behalf of the state of North Carolina. Uh, then we get an award on behalf of the state of North Carolina, and we sub-award that money out to eligible subrecipients. So FEMA, we get federal government, publishes an ELFO, state applies to work, we get a state award. So that's the center box you see on, on our diagram. Here, okay. So then starting at 12 o'clock on our diagram, um, you'll see the green applications uh, uh, trying to learn. So once we get the money, all right, we then solicit applications from prospective subrecipients across the state. 
So you all have seen that process of choice about CLCGP. It was through our website. We had various information webinars about it. We kind of promoted it as best we could. We received many applications, and you all were lucky ones who received them. Okay. So you then apply to some recipient. And again, as I mentioned, for 23 SLCGP, those applications should be online on our website sometime in the month of December. Okay. We'll talk about 22 today. So you've all we've already completed the, the center part of this diagram and 12 o'clock applications part, right? That's all the major application. Um, so then moving on to one o'clock in the diagram, award letters. So you all have received your award notifications already, right? Um, and then that award notifications and congratulations that told you, you know. Your, your project was approved and how much money you, you received. Um, there were a handful of folks um, that, believe it or not, did not receive the full funding they asked for. They only received partial funding. So those folks were also notified that, hey, you might request $100,000 and you only awarded $50,000. Okay, if you were one of those folks, you would got some notification from us and said, please submit an amendment, please submit a less no than any budget. Right now, you only have $50,000, $100,000. So that's, so you get a award notification. Um, and then you turn, you turn your names in, who you want to sign your MOA, you're going to with us. Then we issue the MOA grant agreement. Now, again, most of you folks have already signed your grant, or at least have seen or have a copy of it. Um, we sign it first, you sign it, the sign, comes back to us. We have a fully executed document that's a legal contract, right? So that's your that's your grant agreement or contract. Okay, so then moving down to the six o'clock on our, on our diagram, cost reports, reimbursement requests, okay? One and the same term, they use interchangeably. Okay, so you're all asking about how you get paid. This is how you get paid. Okay, it's a reimbursement grant only, as we said. It's not, you can't, you can't get advances on the grant. So let's say you got $100,000 award. You want to appear performance of the award, which is stated uh, in the award letter and on your MOA. So appear to performance December 1st, 2022, February 28th, 2026. Okay, the, 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 every grant has their own, we call it a POP, right? The, the grant, the POP for this is. 12, 122 to 228, 26. So anytime during that, that period of time, you can submit a request for reimbursement form or a cost report form to us, along with the proper documentation of your expenses. And we'll cover this in the process in more detail. But you submit the documentation to us. If eligible expenditure, that's for the scope of your project and within your project budget. We, excuse me, sorry. We then um, we then go ahead and, we, and issue a reimbursement. And they're all electronic payments, right? To get us a lot of electronic measure payment for it. That's basically it. You'll fill out a form, attach, attach the appropriate documentation after you made the expenditure, um, and then submit it to us. By submit it to us, there's an email box, an SLCGP email box. So you can submit that request to, and we'll go ahead and then pay you electronically. Yep. So I read this in our MOA, but I just yeah. make sure. Yeah. Because the period of performance was December 2022, yeah. we could order today or yesterday. Yes. Yes, you can. I just, yeah. Yeah. Want to hear yeah. it straight? Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you just the only thing is you can't actually get paid, right? Mm -hmm. It's new reimbursement until you actually travel it, right? You can submit eligible expenditures dating back to December 1st, 2022. Right? That's the period form. Yeah. So, so that's basically the process. Um, so you'll be able to call the cost report, bus reimbursement, it's one of the same thing. Uh, you're gonna basically go ahead and submit your bus reimbursement until your balance of your grant is you know is zero. And then you want to close out. That's just right. But during the peer performance of the grant, to move on here uh, on on our, on our diagram, the reporting uh, segment of our diagram, grant line side. Okay. As long as you have an open period performance, there are certain reporting requirements associated, right? And they vary by grant. For this particular grant, it's an annual report, so it's simply once a year report. That form um, is actually an attachment um, to your MOA, um, and I believe we're also emailing. At, I think we're emailing specific forms. Well, there should be an attachment to your MOA. Um, for your progress report. And that's due uh, once a year. It's outlined in here. Um, uh, it, it's, I think it's consistent with the state fiscal year. So I think the first one will be due uh, for the period ending June 30th um, of 2023. I believe it's in the envelope over. And then every fiscal year thereafter, you have 30 days to submit the report. So the period ends June 30th, has to be submitted by July 31st. So that's the annual report. And we'll cover that in the specifically. So that's really the only reporting requirement we have associated with this grant. But there is something else that the federal government imposed on, on, on top of that for us. It's called NCSR, National Cybersecurity Review. So this particular grant being a cybersecurity grant, we got to complete an annual NCSR. And Brad's going to talk about that later, what those requirements are. There's also with this grant some, some cyber hygiene grooming services are required as well. Um, we don't require you to submit documentation to us on that, but you have to make sure you do it, save documentation in case it gets audited. 
And we'll jump around with some of that later to get this part of the presentation. I have a question. Yeah. So the annual progress report yeah. is what you're referring to, but it does not list details as far as funds. You just are looking for a summary of what we spent for a total. Yeah, yeah. It's we'll, we'll go over that. We're gonna have a section on that. Yeah, you know, it's it, there's some specific things you have to follow. That's that's all. So I think it's about page four. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, we, we try we try to minimize the reporting requirements. You know, you can avert some less on you, you know, less on us. Um, in the past, we've required quarterly reports, which just way too burdensome on our some recipients. Really for us to, you know, we don't want to sell anything for the So we served at the end of the um, So that's your that's your obligation. You're know, during the top, right? You want to and, and to complete your grant, and then there's a close out process, right? When, so once once your balance is down to zero, we're going to go ahead and close your grant out. Okay, and there's a whole section on what's required for close at the end. We'll cover it in a, in a little bit. But basically, then once you submit that documentation for closeout that's required, you will get a letter back from us saying, okay, congratulations, your grant is closed out. That is your receipt, or you will, if your ticket that your grant is closed. You'll want to save that letter in your file for when you get off to, right, to show you complete everything required for the grant. Now, with closeout, um, we can decide to come to visit you virtually or in person to go over your documentation of the grant. We may not choose to do that, um, so you kind of got to be on your toes to that a little bit. Um, but you know, most folks, you know, we don't have a problem with y'all. It's a simple process. There's some documentation you submit. Uh, we review it. If all is good, we send you a letter and be done. So that's full out. And that's pretty much the process. If you look at our cycle, so going from 12 o'clock on up to right, right back again, that's the that life cycle. All right. Any questions about the grant life cycle in general? And I said, this is pretty much a cycle for every federal grant that we just talked about right there. All right. And with that, I'm going to stop talking because I didn't talk too long this morning and turn it over to Ms. Lisa Patton, who is our specific grant expert on SLCGP. Lisa will walk you through the next part of her presentation. So, Lisa, go ahead and take it away, please. <clears throat> Yeah, we can't hear you, Lisa. How's that? It helps if I turn the mic on. <laughs> um, good morning again, everyone. I'm I'm Lisa Patton, and um, again, I'm listed here as the subject matter expert, but I believe that's only because I've been watching this grant since its inception, and and uh, the expert part came with coordinating our cybersecurity folks at NCEM to speak to our director to make sure we were in in line to take the responsibility of being the SAA for this grant. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera for bandwidth purposes um, so um, we can begin the presentation um, from here. Um, <clears throat> and, and may I just ask, I, I had a little trouble hearing, who are our folks there on location from City of Hickory? Marcia Rhodes. Hi, I'm Lisa and I am your grants manager, and I just want to say that I live close to the city of Hickory, and I'm also a Steph Curry fan. Now, now oh, we can amazing. <laughs> now, now we can begin begin the uh, slide deck. Um, um, I did want to take one second to also recognize um, a, a grant team member who also has a split role with the our IT department, and that's our database manager Jeff Cox. Um, his previous work in grants gives him the background to know our needs when it comes to these grant documents. Jeff frequently updates our grants database on a regular basis uh, to meet the needs of the team, and we would not be able to do this job without him. Um, I think recognized on our slide deck is Felicia Johnson, our administrative assistant. Her responsibilities include federal financial reporting and procurement for our team. Her most important task as it relates to your grant award is ensuring that those five documents, uh, five required compliance documents are submitted properly, uh, which she sends on uh, for filing at various departments. Um, and Michelle Strong will be speaking to these five documents further in this slide deck. Um, but just uh, of most importance of what Felicia files is that electronic vendor form, uh, because this is the form that ensures your reimbursement for your grant expenditures are made. So um, with that, we will go on um, to this first slide and discuss the purpose. Hey, Lisa, if I can jump in real quick, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention yes. earlier. And we're open to take questions at any time during the presentation. So if you're in the room, just raise your hand. If you're online, raise your virtual hand or put it in the chat. 
Our staff is monitoring the chat to answer questions. If they can't do it, they'll refer to us for answer verbally. Uh, but please just raise your virtual hand or raise your hand uh, in person. We'll sign your question anytime. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. And uh, lastly, though, before I do start, I want to circle back and thank our partner, Janine Childs, um, whom without her hard work and dedication to prepare the team for these trainings, none of what you see in here today would be possible. Janine's worked tirelessly um, on, on putting uh, this entire training platform together, and we greatly appreciate her. All right, so the purpose, uh, the main purpose of the state and local cybersecurity grant program is strengthening, strengthening cybersecurity practices and resilience for our state, local, tribal and territorial governments. Um, it's, imp it's an important Homeland Security mission uh, with the primary focus of this grant. Um, through this funding, uh, it enables us to make targeted cybersecurity investments in state and local government agencies throughout North Carolina and thereby improving the security and critical infrastructure and resiliency of the state. We can move on to the next slide, please. All right, um, so the subrecipient period of performance that you see under the FY22 SLCGP, you'll see it differs from the federal period of performance. This is to allow us time as a grants team to complete the proper reimbursements and ensure that we're closing out these individual projects and then complete the final closeout at the state level. So your MOA period of performance, this period of performance is reflected there. It is retroactive back to 12-1-2022 and it goes and ends on 2-28-2026. All of your eligible expenditures must be made within that period of performance. At the state level, we were awarded $5,360,399. We had over 80 local applications received, and local includes municipalities, counties, and community colleges. Um, of that 80% pass-through requirement, 25% um, of that requirement was passed through to rural entities to ensure we're providing funds to communities with the most need. Rural communities were identified by having less than a 50,000 population count. Uh, again, we were able to approve 67 applications uh, after our federal application was approved by DHS FEMA. Um, and that was from the 80 applicants pool. And NCM provided the additional funds meeting the 10% match requirement. We actually went above that, um, meeting more than the 10% match requirement on behalf of the local. These funds allowed um, more funds to flow to the locals, better provi providing them an opportunity to complete their projects. Let me jump in there real quickly so I can give you a little break for a second. Um, so the way the pass-through funding worked with this grant, if you see we got $5 million federal award, as Lisa said, multiply that by 80%, that's the requirement that you pass through the local government entities as we defined you know, uh, for this grant. So as Lisa said, cities, towns, uh, community colleges were included, and so forth. Anybody subject to the local government commission, the LGC, was emotional need to apply this grant. So 80% of those $5 million had to be passed through by law to the locals. Uh, that's the minimum of what, okay? Then we can spend 20% on state projects and give it to state agencies such as that, such as city board elections. Um, the way it worked out, we ended up passing through much more than 80% to the locals. We passed through over 90% of the money to the locals. So of the 67 approved applications the locals have, we only have three state projects. So 67 of our 70 projects that were approved were local government, only three state projects. Um, so we went above and beyond to try to make sure we got most of the money possible into the hands of the local residents. And then above, above and beyond that, the, 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 the law requires in this particular case a 10% match, okay, to the grant. So what most states will do is they'll say, okay, we're going to give you $90,000, and you've got to buy, provide 10% of that, right? So you got to get $90,000. So you as a local have to, you know, you pay $9,000, you get $9,000. Most states do that. 
We don't do that here. Thankfully, we have the funding to provide the match on behalf of the local government plant that suffers the better. If you have no match requirement for this grant at all, we cover that with FEMA. It also simplifies the administration of grant requests as well. Um, so we're doing that. Um, now, that's not with every grant program that we have. <laughs> that's this grant program, this particular time the decision was made. So I think we can do the work here. Okay, Lisa, go ahead and please take it away. Yes, so we'll move to the 2023 SLCGP. That NOFO was published August 7th, 2023. Our allocation recognized is 10,813,417. We anticipate subrecipient applications uh, to be sent out in or uh, open applications in December. That is estimated uh, December 2023. And um, I believe we'll more than likely have the 30 day av availability to apply for that unless anything changes. The SLCGP website, which um, is in the link, grants in CDPS, um, we ask you to, to frequently check that website for updates um, because it's going to have the most current information as quickly as we can post it. Um, those applications are currently under development. Jeff Cox, uh, our, who I mentioned previously, is working to develop those applications along with the grant staff and cybersecurity committee input. And so again, we we do have to we do hope to have those open in December. And if yeah. we could go on to slide nine. Yeah. If I can jump in real quick there, look at heading 23 SLCGP since you all completed 22 applications. The application form we anticipate will be similar to 22, so it'll be a, a form you fill out, most likely a PDF, maybe a Microsoft form, but that's some kind of document form you fill out complete. Um, what we realized with 22 SLCGP, we didn't necessarily have kind of points assigned to each question, so you see how it was scored. So for the 23 application, we're going to actually put on the application how many points each question is worth, so you have more visibility what you know, want to focus on that application process. That'll be one small group of decks you'll see. There may be some other questions that are tweaked a little bit, but for the most part, I'm going to say. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Did I have a question from the room? No. Okay. All right, so here on the uh, first bullet, you'll see DocuSign. DocuSign is the system through which we send our documents for signature. This is how you received your subaward notification to be able to pre-fill your UEID and your signatories listed in the order you wish them to sign. That's really kind of an important piece to start out the grant. Um, so, and we've actually had some folks come back to tell us that they got the wrong signatory, possibly they've had turnover, or they've listed a wrong email address. So uh, just make sure um, that the folks that you put in to sign your MOA on that award notification are still with you. Double check your award letter to make sure you entered the correct email address and name. Uh, because if you haven't seen your MOA to this point, that could be a reason why. Um, so just double check your award notification. If not, reach out to your grants manager and let them know. That way we can get that turned around in DocuSign and make sure it reaches the right parties. Your memorandum of agreement, which Derek will talk to um, later in this presentation. These were sent out uh, September 15th uh, to begin the signature process. To beginning with two state signatures, our legal team and our director. Um, once it reaches you as the subrecipient, you are given 30 days to sign this from the date you first received it in your inbox, not from the date that the document was generated. Uh, you are allowed 30 days to sign from the date it's received. And as of this morning, we have 42 of those MOAs have been fully executed and returned to NCEM. And at last count, uh, before this presentation began, we have 25 remaining to be fully executed. And again, you have 30 days to do that. So just you know, mark your calendars from the date you received that MOA. Cost reports, we can go into a little more detail uh, later on in the presentation as well. Um, these forms will be forthcoming to you uh, as these are developed at DPS Fiscal. So we take your fully executed MOA and a form and send this off. So we have to wait for that cost report to come back to us before we can send that to you. 
you will be receiving your cost report either from your grants manager or possibly from NCEM Grants One. And that is uh, the inbox that is monitored by, by our administrative assistant, Felicia Johnson. We ask that you do please allow 30 days from the time you fully execute your MOA to receive your first cost report to fill out. And it's just because, you know, we have a lot of these coming in. We have to get a fiscal, a time, a, you know, a, a lot them enough time to get them prepared um, to be sent back out to you. OK, and so the annual progress reports, um, these are attachment two of your MOA and they reflect your due dates in 2024 and 2025. So if you'll take a look at those progress reports, again, those are attachment two, and that will, uh, uh, Derek will speak more to those as well, uh, but those will show you the due dates and uh, kind of guide you on what you need to report out on. Site visit closeout reporting. Okay, so you need to be prepared in the event that you are selected for an in-person site visit. Your files should include all documents that you've submitted to us. This includes a copy of your award notification, your MOA, your originally submitted application, cost reports, annual reports, and a copy of the five required documents, including your procurement policy. Um, and any other documents you feel pertain to purchases, anything like anything like that. Um, and again, Derek will speak more to those um, site visit and close out reporting requirements as he goes through the MOA. All cost reports, annual reports, and any cybersecurity programmatic questions should be sent to the SLCGP at ncdps.gov inbox, which is also in the chat. Thank you, Janine. Um, these cost reports and annual reports are reviewed by the programmatic team to ensure that the project scope of work and expenditures meet the requirements. Then they're sent to us as the assigned grants managers for processing and filing to complete your reimbursement processes and filing processes. Um, and the reason they do that is because our cybersecurity programmatic team, obviously, they are strong in uh, cybersecurity skills, and we are strong in grants manager skills, and we don't always speak the same language, but we work together to, to, to make this happen. Lisa, if I, jump in, yeah, if I could jump in real quick. Sorry, just go yes. back to that previous slide, Brad. Um, so a couple things. Lisa mentioned annual report progress in the MOA, and we've got some questions about it. Um, it's an attachment to your MOA, but also if you look at page three of your MOA, Page three, uh, paragraph six C, that lays out the schedule of when those uh, annual reports um, are required. Um, so basically, for this grant, as we already mentioned, the period report is consistent with the state fiscal year. So the period report would be through 630. Um, then you'd have them due uh, 30 days after that. So for that. The first one will be 73124, then 73125, and then we'll find a reimbursement request. That's it in the MOA. Um, the other thing I want to point out, basically, as you see, when you use this SLCGB email box of DocuSign to kind of manage this grant right now, um, that's great. It's simple uh, for y'all to use, but that's not a sustainable way to do business for us as an organization. So we are shifting to an online grants management solution um, called Salesforce. It will not impact this grant or the 23 SLCGB grant, but most like or the, 20, the 23 program. It may impact the 24 or 25 grants. We ship to a new grant management system for all of our grants uh, in the CEM that we're dealing with. So right now it's based on email and DocuSign eventually in the future when we go to a, 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 an online system uh, called Salesforce. And the nice thing about Salesforce solution is you will each have your own account. You will log into it. You'll see your grants and all your documents right there. So you'll have full visibility and transparency. Right now we do it via email and access database, which is not a single business file for us. So we're trying to make some improvements in the future. Um, and then, uh, as Lisa mentioned, um, we'll cover a little bit more on annual reports and then reimbursement request process. So we want to make some questions about that, and we'll cover closeouts as well. That's a good point. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, um, so uh, before I move to this slide, Derek, uh, we have a lot of chat going on about folks okay. that did not receive any attachments with their MOA. And I think I know what the problem and issue may be, so I'm just going to address it here. Okay. Um, 
When you receive a fully executed copy through DocuSign, you have to download all of the files. And what it sounds like is the only pieces that were downloaded were the MOA itself and not attachments one through seven. So um, because I'm looking in DocuSign and the attachments are there. Um, so if you have access to that DocuSign link or the email that you received, you can click on that email. And uh, it might say a link expired, but it will send you a new link. You can open the new link in your email. It will open the document back up. You're able to download all the MOA and the attachments. So I, I believe that's what's happened here because I'm not seeing that the attachments are missing from our side. Hey, Lisa, Tanisha has a question as well. Um, I'll answer. Tanisha, please uh, say your question. <clears throat> yeah, well, just uh, one thing that we realized was with our attachments, um, within the email, one of the attachments said um, attachment two, but we found attachment two at the end of the document. So maybe that's what some people are seeing. Yeah, attachment two was a blank cover sheet, Lee, but then we found, we actually found attachment two at the end. It was the very last document once we printed everything out. Thank you, Tanisha. That attachment two is the annual progress report form, I believe. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an important attachment. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. I'm sorry about the, the confusion. No problem. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Any yeah, other questions? I, I apologize. Um, do uh, go back to that DocuSign link if, if you are having issues. If you do not or are not able to access a copy through that DocuSign link, reach out to your grants manager. We can get you a copy of those attachments. Let's take a break, Lisa. Real quick. Any other questions from anybody in the room or online? We're going to cover a lot of material. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, that was the end of that slide. So we'll go on to the electronic file naming conventions. If you were a part of the previous informational sessions online, uh, you, you may have noted that some of the, the naming convention differs a little bit. The reason that is the five required documents that you had to turn in, that was agency specific for filing purposes. This naming convention is specific to your grant award. So um, Jonesboro County FY22 SLCGP cost report one. We want you to begin with your agency, the grant year and grant name, and the document type. So if you're submitting your annual report, that would be Jonesboro County FY22 SLCGP annual progress report. The reason we ask for this, we often get scan documents that say scan one, two, three, four, five. You can see how easily it would be when we're receiving hundreds of documents a day to misfile this or for your cost report not to get paid. <laughs> so it's, it's very important that you uh, follow this naming convention for any documents you submit, even if it's a question. If it's a question regarding FY22 SLCGP grant side, please put that in, in the subject line of your email. Um, this way, if you apply for FY22 and willing, uh, God willing, you're awarded for that year as well, we can keep these two grant years separate because they're going to, these two grants are going to override one another. So you just want to be sure that you're asking the right questions, the right mm -hmm. grant year, and the right document. And I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Brad Garrett, to speak to you about the National Cyber Security Review and the Cyber Hygiene Services requirements. Good morning, everybody. Um, Brad, can you turn your camera? No, I can't because I've got these. Oh, you're stuck in one door? Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Brian Garrett, and I'm the grant manager here at Brian Bryant. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about the special requirement for this grant. It is a requirement of the grant that you do a national cybersecurity review. Uh, 
It's a free, anonymous, annual self-assessment of your hardware situation. Uh, it's annual reporting period, and it starts October the 1st, and it runs through the end of the following February. Uh, for this grant, because it's, it's uh, retroactive, you will be responsible to fill out a cyber review starting in this uh, actual period, which will start October 1st. Now, we have the link to the website. Uh, most of you being new grant recipients would have to register uh, with uh, for the cyber review. Um, it's very easy. It's on a web page, you just follow the procedures. Once you finish it, there's like a bunch of questions that they ask you about the situation with your cyber review. Once you finish it, you can print out a certificate, completion certificate. And what we ask is that you send that certificate to us so we can have it on file. Because sometimes it might be a question of what did you, did you do the cybersecurity review? So then we have the certificate on hand that we can show that it's been completed. Because uh, what happens is we get a monthly report that shows everybody your projects and if you've already done this review. So that's on that on the uh, cybersecurity review. Also this year it's new. It's the cybersecurity hygiene services. Now this is something that you go in. It's a vulnerability scan, and this scan is run, I believe, it's run once a week once they start. Uh, it's also services are provided weekly. It gives you a report and ad hoc. Now you don't have to send us anything on this. It's just the fact that it is a requirement for the grant that you do this. Now there's an we also have the link for that one. I believe what you have to do is you have to send an email uh, from your organization. And then what happens with that email, we will send you back information about how you vote for the scan. And then that's how we do it. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks so much, Brad. And now we're going to turn it over to my partner, Michelle Strong, to discuss the five required documents. Hello again, everyone. I'm just going to quickly run through the uh, five required documents so you can have a you know clearer understanding of what we're referring to when we say five required documents. Um, so as you can see, the five required documents are State of North Carolina Substitute W-9 form, um, the electronic payment vendor verification form, conflict of interest policy, sworn notarized no overdue tax debt certification, and the procurement policy. Um, just please note that the five required documents must be in place um, after the um, MOA is actually fully executed. And uh, you cannot actually receive payment until these five required documents have been received by us. Um, the, um, you only need to submit these documents one time. Um, the only time you would need to resubmit anything if, is if there have been any changes or any updates. Um, if that occurs, you um, please just notify us and then you would need to update your documents. Um, and as far as the electronic vendor payment form, um, that form must be signed. And remember that you all also must include a canceled check. Um, I'm going to just quickly share my screen just so um, I'm just going to show you an example of each of these documents. Again, just so you'll have a clear understanding of what it is that we are looking for. Um, so this first document here is the vendor electronic payment form. Again, like I said, it must be signed um, and you also must include a canceled check or a letter from your um, from your bank. Next state uh, next uh, document is the state grant certification. No overdue tax form. Um, uh, again, this form must be signed and notarized. Uh, next, I have just an example of what the conflict of interest policy needs to look like. 
Um, also, what the procurement policy must look like. This is just the first page of um, a city's um, procurement um, manual. Um, and again, this is just the first page to give you an idea. And then the sub, the state of North Carolina substitute W-9 form. Remember that we are looking for the state of North Carolina substitute W-9 form. Don't get it confused with the um, federal IRS W-9 form. We do need the state of North Carolina substitute W-9 form. Michelle. Yes. Could you go back to the electronic underpayment form? and show them where the email address is. Yeah, so you're going to show the question one, if you can show them about the electronic underpayment form. Yeah, I'm back on that form. So here is the vendor electronic payment form. And... You can share your screen, Michelle. Oh, I'm not sharing? Oh, I thought I was still sharing. Oops. OK, can you see it now? There we go. <clears throat> OK. Um, and what were you saying, Janine, the email address? The email address. That okay. the location yeah. where um, they wish to receive notification that the electronic payment is coming. We need to input the address there, email address of the person who needs to know that most important is. Yes, ma'am. So we just like this second got an email that said we hadn't turned in our five required documents. We have. Okay, let me talk okay. to Jane and we'll check on. Thank you. Okay, and that is it for the five required documents. Okay, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Brad, before that for that information. Um, just for the good of the group of everybody, just hearkening back to the actual specific MOA. Um, Brad was talking about the, the NCSR requirements and cyber hygiene requirements. Every MOA, you're following along at home. Page three of the MOA, paragraph six, delta, six D, lays out the NCSR requirements that Brad just talked about and the specific dates that the NCSRs are required. Um, the first NCSR is for 2023. It's required to be completed um, starting now and running through 228-24. So you have from now till 22824 to complete the NCSR, your first one that's required. Um, and as Brad said, uh, we ask that you do have a completion certificate uh, once you complete it, uh, as evidence that you have completed that each year. Um, we just received an email from a group called CISA, CISA. Um, they're the group that runs the NCSR, and they just announced to us that they have opened the NCSR for this year. So it actually opened a couple of days ago. So it's open right now. Brad's going to go ahead and cut and paste, I believe, right? The content of that email into the chat. You'll see it. And it gives some more information about how you can log on if you're a first time user, how to register. Uh, if you have an NCSR already on file from last year, apparently there's a way you might be able to import your data over. So you have to do it again. So that's in this email. So that's a new feature they've had. So God, Brad's going to post the, the text of this email into the chat so everybody has it for the NCSR. And then if you read in the MOA, so that's the first NCSR. Second one will be for 2024. Again, you'll complete that from 10 124 to 228.25. Anytime within that time frame, save your completion certificate. The third one will be 2025, 10 125 to 228.26. Um, and then the fourth one uh, will be for 2026, between 10 126 and 228.27. So four NCSRs that you do for this particular grant. Save your completion certificate each year. Okay. Um, NCSR is also required for another grant program that we have called HSGP, Online Security Grant Program. Uh, some of y'all may have received that grant as well. If you if you if you already do the NCSR for HSGP, you only have to do one NCSR a year. So one NCSR counts for both HSGP and SLCGP. If you get both grants, you don't need to do it twice. And that's also explained in this email as well. We're posting it in the chat. So if you have HSGP, SLCGP. Do it once, say the certificate accounts for both grants. All right, Brad, get that information in the chat for us. And then on the five required documents that uh, Michelle um, described in great detail for us, so thank you, Michelle. Um, that is on uh, page three as well, paragraph six, Bravo, 
required documents. And it's if the, and, and the MOA itself, when you see it online, it's got active hyperlinks to the actual forms you have to fill out. So that state W9 form that Michelle mentioned, that's a link to the state W9 form. It's actually called substitute uh, W9. Some folks inadvertently are submitting federal W9s. We, we can't do that. We need to stay in W9. So that link will take you right through the correct form. Electronic vendor payment form that Michelle mentioned, there's a link to that on there. And again, the electronic vendor payment form, as Michelle mentioned, it's not just filling out the form. You have to submit a copy of a canceled check or a bank statement to verify the account the funds are going to go to. Um, we have had folks mess that up, quite honestly. We've had folks believe that give us copies of personal checks. Um, give us bank statements, bank statements with financial transactions in it, you know, long bank statements. That's not what we're looking for. A canceled check or a, a letter from your bank just saying this is the account information that we need to send it to. Okay, that's to attach to, the, you know, to, to, to that form. Um, and then Michelle showed you the other documents as well. All right, any questions about NCSR, uh, cyber hygiene, as Brad mentioned, or the five required documents? Okay, I think one more. All right, the cyber hygiene is on page four of the MOA, by the way. That's paragraph six, echo six, uh, six E. Uh, that is cyber hygiene, describes that as well. Uh, just enough of that. Again, as Brad mentioned, cyber hygiene is something you'd have to do as a condition of receiving that CLCGP. You don't turn that documentation into us, just have it available, prove that you comply in case it's asked for. Uh, for some project. Okay, all right, I think we're ready for a break. It's 10 30, it's our first scheduled break. So, Jean, how long are the breaks for? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. All right, I'm going to put a Google timer up on the screen for those that are following at home. We're going to take a 10 minute break and we can be at 10 40. Uh, thank you. I'm going to put this on mute here and I'll put a 10 minute timer up. Derek, if you don't mind, when you set the timer, um, look at your cell phone. I'm going to have to give you a call.
yeah. you know. Yes. Oh, okay, folks. Um, I think we had a little extended break because I forgot to hit start on my time. So you have a few minutes to answer this. Enjoy that. Um, I think we're all back now online. If you can please rejoin us, if not back. A um, couple things during the break that came up. Uh, Lisa wanted to clarify that the confusion with the five documents and the email this might have received. Lisa, can you go ahead and verify that for us, please? Yes, sir. So that was a blast email to all SLCGP sub recipients as a reminder of the five documents to submit it if it had not been submitted. Um, so it, it may have been properly misworded or improperly worded to uh, alert you that your documents had not been submitted. Rest assured, uh, we do have, um, I think, somewhere around only 10 uh, subrecipients left to submit. So your documents are on file. And unless you've gotten any messages directly from Felicia Johnson and the NCM Grants One inbox, um, you can rest assured that your documents are on file. Um, again, we only have about 10 subrecipients left to submit. Um, so if you know that the, that your documents have been submitted, rest assured they are on file. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that, Lisa. I appreciate that. OK. Uh, are there any questions before we begin our, our more detailed discussion of the MOA and, and the other card documents? OK, so hey, seeing no questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, Brad, to show us the uh, documents. Before we talk about the MOA, uh, I do want to just bring up and I'll share my screen here to do that. I hope everybody can see it. OK, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the document? It's actually the word notification, some word notification. You good on that? All right, excellent. OK, so I just took a software notification here and blacked out some of the specifics, so it looks more generic. But um, before you got your MOA, right, you should have received this subaward notification. Um, and just want to point out at the top of subaward notification, uh, you'll see the period of performance, the project title, the amount of the award, and the MOA number, right? It's right at the very, very header at the top or right hand part of the uh, document. Um, so basically, that's Outline that information is trans is, is transposed to your MOA, right? So that's telling you in advance what your form is going to be, how much you got, and what you were awarded. Okay. Um, and then here it talks about some other information. You have the documents, the five documents that are required. Provide your UDID, right? That's a requirement to use any federal fund. You have to have a UDID. And then the names of folks you want to sign your your MOA. Because this is the first document you received. Say congratulations, you received that award. I think he should be no questions about that. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. So then we'll get your MOA. Let's put it wrong. Put it wrong. Put it wrong. Put it wrong. Let me try to make that a little bigger. All right. Well, I can see that document is big enough for you. All right. So then you get your MOA. Um, and again, the, the top of the, of the screen, right, the top, the top right hand part of the screen um, has the subject information, your UEID, your tax ID, your EIN. There are two different, you know, two different numbers. One's a tax ID, one's a UEID. Your UEID um, is basically telling kind of like social security number. Uh, it stays with your organization for life. Doesn't change, it's always the same. So anytime you apply for a federal grant, that's your UEID, that's how they identify you. So that never changes. That's what that's why they ask for that. Then you have the amount of your award in period form. So all that comes over from your award letter. And then what happens is that application you submitted that got approved, you know, as your award, that becomes attachment one to the MOA. Okay. So the attachment one to your MOA is your approved scope of work, right? That's your application. Now, again, in some cases, some folks only receive partial funding. You would then ask to go ahead and submit an updated budget to say how you're going to spend that money because you didn't receive all the money you asked for, right? So in some cases, we'll ask for an amendment, amended application. For the most part, what you apply for is what you got, right? And that becomes the attachment ones of the application. That's the eligible scope of work on which you can get uh, reimbursement, okay, for stuff in that application. So that becomes attachment one. Then we go on with the MOA. Again, it's 17 pages long. I apologize. It's, it's a legal requirement. It's a contract. A lot of this stuff, again, will never, ever come up, right? But just in the event that it does, it's covered in the MOA, right? So... First, the, the, the purpose paragraph, starting on page one, the, the, first, the first paragraph, just background information on the purpose of the grant program. Um, and um, we already covered a lot of that. 
But the important sentence here, as I already mentioned, the last sentence of paragraph one, the scope of the work is the approved application that's made by recipient with any amendments approved by recipient. So you all are the sub-recipient, right? We're the recipient because FEMA, in this case, by government's the grantor. So the grantor, whether the recipient be passed through the sub-recipient. Some people would confuse that. So you're, we call you the sub-recipient or the grantee, right? So you know those terms that are interchangeable. And this, you're sub-recipient or grantee, all right? And again, that scope works uh, is attachment one to the, uh, to the MOA. Um, so then there's just some information about how this particular grant was authorized and funded. Uh, and the way this, this particular grant program uh, was funded, it was through this um, a particular Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, I, uh, I, I, uh, a, uh, IIJA Act. Um, and the way it was funded in federal appropriations, it was four year funding. All right. So the first year was 22. We got $5 million for that state of North Carolina. We were one of the top states funding for that. The second year for 23 is $10 million. Okay. So the first year we got $5 million with a 10% match. Second year, 23 is $10 million with a 20% match. Okay. For year three and four, the funding goes down. So they kind of give you some baseline funding. It spikes up in the second year, then it starts ramping down in the third and fourth years, and the match requirement goes up. So what they're trying to do federally is they're trying to say, we're going to give you money as a state to build your capacity, right? But once you reach that capacity, you need less money. That's why they kind of ramp it up and then ramp it down. So you're going to see a very robust 23 application cycle coming up. But at 24 and 25, that money's going to get harder to get because we're going to get less money to pass through GL. And the match part goes up as well. So that's the way that it's, 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 it's authorized. Um, I don't know right now, I've been told they're trying to get additional federal funding to continue by sell CGP beyond that year four. Okay. Many of our grant programs that we have, they're funded almost in perpetuity. Every year we get the same grants. This one's only four years right now that we know of. We hope it will continue. But beyond that, we don't know anything about federal funding. Hopefully it will. Be okay. Yep. Is there a feel for whether or not the match will still be met by the state for next year or the years coming? We, we, we hope. We hope. But again, that's made on that's made on a yearly determination, right? I know how much money we have, basically. So, yeah. And related to that question, do you know, you said the match requirement is going to go up. Yeah. Do you have an idea? Like this year it was 10%, even though the state yeah. made. Right. So in 23 is 20%. We're, paying, we're going to pay 23. Um, yeah, we're going to pay for 23. So we're covering for 23. 24 and 20, yeah, 24, I think it's 30 percent, 25 is 40 percent, I believe. Okay. Please, you can check that and make sure, uh, I believe that's, that's, what, that's what it is. Uh, yeah. But again, hopefully we'll cover it. I can't commit to that, so it just depends on our budget like that topic. That's why I wanted to know what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, and again, so beyond that year four, I don't know if we need any We really know if we do, it's needed. Um, you know, this is unfortunately, it's it's a rural area, right? You hear about cyber attacks every day affecting governmental organizations and private businesses. It's not going away. It's a big problem. We need the money for it. You all need the money for it. So we hope it doesn't go away, but it depends what the economy is. So that's basically what our team talks about. Um, so three, it gets into some more information about funding. Um, we don't really worry about that too much. Paragraph four, this basically talks about who is eligible to receive a sub award. It's a very specific legal definition of who's eligible to get this sub award from us. And here we just basically, you look at paragraph of four, um, this is on um, the page two of the MOA, paragraph four, as we go. Um, this definition here is right out of the general statutes, okay, NCGS 159.44. And anytime you see these blue kind of the hyperlinks basically in, in, on the screen, you can, you can click and, and hit that hyperlink and we'll take the source document. All right, so you can see the actual language of the statute. But, um, you know, you think the local government's a simple definition, not in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's uh, 10 lines long as what it was old government in North Carolina. Um, so um, all these entities are eligible local governments. Additionally, because it's a cyber grant, we include community colleges in the definition as well. Now, we had a really good question about our Homeland Security Grant Program. Our community college is able to apply for that. They're not eligible for the cyber grant program. It's a different definition. Just the cyber grant program is just the cyber program. Yeah. Because of the way the laws are written. So, um, all these different entities are eligible to apply. And what we basically do um, is we have a list from the LGC, Local Government Commission, um, and the list 
as I think over 1,300 different entities that are considered local government organizations here in North Carolina. So if we had a question from a seller saving applying, if they were eligible, we would go to that list the LGC provided. And if you're on their list, you'd be eligible. If you're not on the list, you would not be eligible. That's why we adjudicate them. Um, for the most part, we can have a lot of future questions about that, but if it does come in the future, we have a list of what that is. We can base no regard for local government entity. Um, but that's who's eligible. Um, as well as community colleges. So that's what this that's what this paragraph uh, says right here. So it's an important paragraph. Um, so you're basically certifying when you sign this MLA. You know, we already know you are, but you're certifying when you sign this MLA that you are in fact a local government entity that meets this legal definition, right? So if for some reason you weren't and you signed this MLA and it came back later on, you know, we say, well, they told us they weren't, right? So go go talk to them, right? It's not our fault. They signed this other local government entity. That's what we have this in. Kind of covering ourselves on this. Um, here's the other requirements we talked about. Um, you know, having a UEID um, that's required for any federal grant. You also have to be registered in SAM, System for Award Management. Um, and SAM, unlike UEID, expires after one year. You have to renew your SAM registration every year. So sometimes subrecipients get it when they apply, but then they don't renew it. Okay, so you must stay current on your SAM. UEID, apply for it once, like social security number, you get it, you never have to touch it. SAM registration, you have to renew it every year. That's what this paragraph basically says. Okay. Um, and then here, it talks about if you have to complete your procurements and later on the end of the year performance, and it goes into the RFR process, which is covered right below. So that's paragraph four. Um, paragraph five gets into how you actually get compensated and paid. Um, so basically, the important part of this paragraph is um, right here. Grant funds will be dispersed, okay, according to your project budget you upon receipt of evidence that the funds have been invoiced, project services you received, and proof of payments provided. So when you submit your request for reimbursement, we talk about our appropriate source documentation. This is what has to accompany your request for reimbursement, right? Has to be an eligible expenditure within the scope of your approved scope of work and your budget, right? And have, you have to have a receipt or an invoice, you know, for the item or service. Then you have to have proof that you actually paid that invoice or receipt, right? So you can't just send us an invoice that you were billed for. You have to show it was paid. Cancel check, electronic payment, bank statement, many ways you can do that. You have to show it was paid. So, so a copy of a check is not enough. You want to cancel check? You keep the cancel check. Yeah, so cancel check. A copy, a copy of the cancel check is fine, but it's a cancel check. Yeah, sure, it was paid. A lot of folks will submit a bank statement. This gave me sort of an ACS bank statement. So it's a good place to do it. But we need to show it because not saying y'all would do this, right? But in theory, somebody could just submit a bunch of invoices they never pay, get reimbursed for something they never actually paid. So the federal government says we have to have not just invoice, but proof of payment as well. Okay. So it's very important to both of that. Um, and then we'll go into the request for reimbursement in the next kind of further down, but you also have to submit a summary of your expenses with your request for reimbursement. Okay, so it will be a Word document, a PDF, a spreadsheet. You have to indicate, you know, hey, this is what I'm claiming for reimbursement with this request. I mean, that's important because a lot of times you'll have invoices or receipts that have multiple items on them. You'll be claiming certain parts of those invoices or receipts, right? You have to clearly indicate this is what I'm you know, requesting reimbursement for, not this other stuff. And it's stated in this in, later in the seven way as well, but we will not, we cannot reimburse taxes. So it's very important. A lot of people get confused on this. Okay. You might have you might have to pay taxes, right? You might probably get a refund of those taxes later at the end of the year, you know, through the Department of Revenue. That doesn't concern us. We cannot reimburse taxes. If yes, you might have a bill or invoice that includes sales tax, if you submit that to us, you must exclude the taxes from the reimbursement. We cannot, we cannot pay taxes. So if you pay $110 for something. Ten dollars with taxes, we can only reverse hundred dollars off to the end. The end must exclude the taxes. How about shipping? Um, shipping. Good question. I think we do pay. We do. We do reimburse shipping. I don't think there's any prohibition against that. Shipping only is expensive. It's just the taxes. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Good question. All right. And then basically, um, so essentially, the period of performance of the grant ends on two uh, twenty eight twenty six. But we give you all 30 days to submit your final request for reimbursement after that. So you basically have um, 30 days after the pop to submit your zero balance, you know, request for reimbursement. All right, you yeah, already done so. 
that last request to reimburse for down to a zero balance must be submitted 30 days after no later than 30 days after the pop. That's what it says. All right, so that's pretty much it for that. Um, all right, so we go into here some other information. Um, basically, you know, what we're saying here in this uh, next in this paragraph um, 5A, um, understanding what your funding level is, and we can't give you more than that. Um, you know, we, we, there is some legal requirements here that it's subject to the availability of funds, appropriated funds. Um, if for some reason, you know, the, we lost funding for this, I don't see it happening, we would notify you if we lost funding. And at that particular time, you'd be paid for everything else you could not receive that notice. But after, after that point on, you would not be submitting a request for return because we lost funding for the grant. All right. So God forbid we got screwed up in an audit or the federal government cut our funding off for some reason. We'd have to notify our sub recipient and say, okay, um, we're no longer funding for this grant. We'll pay for everything you set up to this point, but no more beyond that. That's what this paragraph says. It's never happened, but again, would it happen potentially? Yes, that's why it says the MLG. It's a legal provision. Um, that's pretty much what that says. And then I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of this MOA is just legalistic stuff. It's never going to be really relevant to you. This paragraph here, you don't read anything else. Read this paragraph. Paragraph six. These are the conditions. These are your basic, your, your daily responsibilities, okay, that you have with the manager of this grant. This is stuff you need to know. Paragraph six, okay, which starts here on uh, page three of the, of the MOA. All right. So, Sub recipient, um, again, there's no match requirement. So we look at 6A, subparagraph two. We indicate here clearly there's no match required for this. That's an important paragraph right there. Um, and we also say here in 6A3, you have to submit your request for reimbursement with all required documentation attached. So again, to that question we had earlier, it's a reimbursement grant only. You don't get any advances on the grant. Um, we have our cost center in here, which is just the way we internally pay this. So this is important information for us. Cost center is you know, the HU2, HU2. We need to know that. That's why it's in there. It doesn't, doesn't affect you all. It keeps us trading in our county. Um, here's your required documents in paragraph 60. Michelle went over in detail what these documents were. These are the five that you must have in conjunction with your award. And again, you cannot be paid unless all these documents are on file. Okay? So you will not be any, you any payments. All these documents are on file. Um, and once you submit these documents, they're good. You don't have to resubmit them again. Okay, so if you had another grant with us, say you got SLCGP in 23 as well, if nothing's changed in these documents, you don't have to resubmit them. Okay? The only time you resubmit them is if something changed on your end. Right? So if your bank changed, submit a new vendor payment form. If your tax information changed, submit a new tax form. If you had a new public interest policy you know, or a new consumer policy, you would submit any updates to us. But once you submit these things to us, the assumption is, they're good uh, until you change them, unless well, another change. Okay, so you only have to submit it once and let you have an update today. So that's basically what, what this paragraph is talking about. We talked about the progress reports with a 6C. Um, again, this, the schedule of when they're due is right here 731 24, 731 25, and what your final FI. Okay. Um, the other important thing is. Even if there's no expenditures and a progress report must be submitted. Okay. So even if let's say you let's say you don't spend any money in year one of this grant, okay, you still have to submit your annual report. Okay. Until the grant's closed. Okay. So um, you know, if I'm thinking work burden-wise, if you can spend your money sooner rather than later, you know, maybe it's some burden on you, right? But yeah, you have the full period of performance to, to, to spend the money. That's basically this one of our uh, We talked about the NCSR, and Brad put the information in the chat. And he tells us more because as we were speaking, they opened up the NCSR. So the information is in the chat now. So it's talks about what to do for that. Yeah, I think you heard a question earlier too. These, again, these are all active hyperlinks. So if you want the link to go to Isaac, just click on that. You'll see how to go ahead and take care of your NCSR. These are when they're due. Uh, this paragraph 60. Okay. Cyber hygiene is paragraph 60. All right. So this paragraph six is a very important paragraph in terms of what you're responsible for. So I'm going to pause there. Are there any questions online or in the room? See me online. Okay, great. All right, moving on. Paragraph seven. Subplantation. We just had a discussion about this going up, right? This this paragraph generates a lot of confusion, <laughs> um, and it's only it's something that. 
the federal government requires us to put in our grant notification, so that's why we do it. Honestly, it's not something we actively enforce as an agency. We're putting this in there just to let you know what the rules are. You know, if you get audited or something comes up, you know, these are the rules you've agreed to. What the theory of this is, is the federal government doesn't want you to take federal funds to replace already appropriate local funding that you have, right? So the, the, clear, the clear example of this is, let's say you wanted to um, get money for a, a, a position, right? To pay salary for a position, okay? If you already have local funds to pay for that position, what you're not supposed to do is take federal funds and then pay for that position, right? So you then spend your, your local money on something else. Now, if you were creating a new position that wasn't already funded and you want to fund it with federal funds, you could do that. Once you create that position, if you want to apply for continuing grant funding to, to sustain that position, create it with federal funds, you could do that, right? That's really what this is designed to cover. It gets confusing when you're talking about equipment and reimbursements because, as the gentleman pointed out, you have to purchase the equipment in order to be reimbursed for it, right? So are you supplanting yourself by doing that? No, we're not going to, we're going to pay you for it. But it's, it's, it's a little, it's a little logical, you know, it's a logic argument. Yeah, you'll still get paid for equipment. We you know we have to buy it first and reimburse you for it. All right, any questions about self-limitation? And you can take training on this that goes on for hours about this. I gave you the 30 second uh, your clip notes version of it. Yeah, this is a legal provision. Okay, go of work, paragraph eight. Again, this is a very important paragraph. So paragraph six and paragraph eight are important paragraphs. This is, this is the daily stuff we need to know. Um, so we'll get into that here, paragraph eight, scope of worth. All right, and this starts on page four of the MOA. All right, so documentation to be provided throughout the pot, somewhat repetitive here, but it talks about here in 6A and the reports, NCSR, cyber hygiene services compliant upon request of recipient, right? So again, we're not, we're not collecting your CHS documentation, but you have to have it available upon request. Um, any audits or corrective actions. So this is this is important because um, we're required to monitor our subrecipients throughout the years of legal ground we have under the federal regulations. And we rely a lot on our own audits for that purpose. Okay. So most organizations will have to have an audit every year. You know, you do that yourselves. And what happens is if there's any findings related to our specific grant programs, our uh, DPS internal auditors will bring that to our attention. Okay, we will then contact you as a sub recipient and say, hey, we need corrective actions on the findings in your audit related to our grant programs. Now, you may have a million findings in your audit, and I've seen them, unfortunately. Okay, I'm not saying you, but in general, I've seen them. Okay, we don't care about all that stuff. I, I tell you right now, almost every audit I've seen with every uh, local government entity has some findings related to Medicaid and Medicare. Okay, it's just a, it's a mess of a program. There's always some audit money with that. We don't care about that, right? If you have a finding about SLCGP, I very much care about that. I'm going to contact you and say we need corrective actions for that program. So the way we monitor you is we review the results of your own internal audits. You audit yourself, we see if there's findings, we take corrective actions with respect to that. That's kind of what this paragraph is. Um, if you were to do exercise, we use this funding for exercises. There's a requirement to have an after action report. So this would also have to be submitted with your request of reimbursement. So if one of you want to get reimbursed over the cybersecurity exercise, you have to have an active action report in accordance with this HC doctrine. Uh, so you click on the link and see what it is. Basically, you have to record the findings of your exercise. You can't do an exercise without itself recording about what you're learned, right? Um, so in order to get reimbursed for an exercise, you have to have an active action report. That's what that says. Um, if you have, and you also have to have any kind of training course, rosters, descriptions, and syllabuses. So let's say, you know, you were being funded for what I'm just training today, right? That was part of your grant. You want to be reimbursed for that. You have to submit not just your cost documentation, but also that sign-in sheet that's gone out, right? Showing who all signed up for it, the syllabus of your training, you know, what you cover. All that has to be submitted as well to get reimbursed for training. So exercise will cover after action report. Training requires court drops, description, and syllabus as well. And exercises also require a, a, um, a roster as well. That's what this, that's what this basically says. Okay. This gives you a little more specificity about the invoices and receipts that are required. Okay. There's um, a lot of questions come up about this. Um, so, this talks about everything that has to happen. You can read it there in 6H. Um, again, as I said, the gist of it is a lot of invoices, even proof of payment, you'll see a lot of different transactions on there. You must clearly indicate which ones apply to the main market request that you're making. Uh, that's essentially what this says. 
and then catch all the other documentation requests from the house. So again, we're the recipient of the sub Okay. Moving on to paragraph nine, again, another very important paragraph. Um, these are our responsibilities to you, paragraph nine. So nine A do E, what we're promising to do to you. Um, what we're basically saying here is we will reimburse you for eligible activities. Right? We're going to monitor your completion of your activities, probably funding for this, and um, we're going to provide you the required forms to fill out for your annual progress report and to get your reimbursement request. Here. So we have some responsibilities to you, but then in paragraph nine sub recipient, you've got a lot of responsibilities to us as well. This gets into this as well. So again, another important paragraph here now. And this is moving on to page five of the MOA. If you're following at home. Okay. So we already talked about the MOA had to be signed and returned us within 30 days of after you received the MOA. So we're still within that period now. I think it's time for most of y'all, but because they returned the MOA, we can get them into us as soon as possible within 30 days to do it. Um, you want to spend the money in accordance with all the legal requirements. You know, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, procurement. Okay, so paragraph nine sub recipient C. This gets this generates a lot of questions. Okay, this whole paragraph here. And again, you can take procurement class all federal grants that go for weeks. Okay, I'm going to still announce the simplest term for you as I understand that. Okay, if you are local government and you're using federal government funds, you have to follow the strictest of your own policy, state policy, or federal government policy. Okay, the strictest of those policies has to be filed. To procure these items. Okay. How's that manifest itself? This is why we ask for your procurement policy as one of the documents, right? Because we need to make sure if you're following your own policy that you're actually following. Okay. But if you're using federal funds, right, there's different thresholds in terms of how much competition is required for a purchase based on how much you're expending. Finance folks and provisionals can appreciate this. So at the federal government level, okay, there's a micro purchase threshold of $10,000. So if you're buying something for ten thousand dollars for less than ten thousand dollars, okay, it doesn't require competition. You can go on Amazon and buy it, right? Single quote, no competition required. Easy, it's easy purchase. This is such a small amount, they don't care, right? That's a micro purchase threshold. So it's to your advantage, you know, from a procurement standpoint, keep your purchases small under the micro purchase threshold because they're simplest to do. Okay. Now, if you're above the micro purchase threshold, okay, there's something called a simplified acquisition threshold that's set. In federal terms, that's ten thousand dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So these grants are capped at hundred thousand dollars, right? So you're never going to be above the SAT. You're going to be between ten and two hundred fifty, or even my first level. But within the SAT, more little more is required than a mark post structure. Within the SAT, you have to do a detailed price or cost analysis, um, and then you can have most people say three bolts. Doesn't have to be three bolts technically. You have to have some competition along the detailed price or cost analysis showing what you bought. Once you exceed the simplified acquisition threshold, $250,000, then it becomes full bid, full procurement action, competitive bidding process, which is the most complicated. But that's under the federal rules. You as local government may have different thresholds. Okay, you may say my low, my, my procurement threshold, you know, for my community college is $2,000. That's my small purchase threshold, my procurement threshold, right? So anything less than $2,000, you buy with a single quote. But beyond that, you may have, I need three quotes, or I need four quotes, or I need to do this or that, okay? In that case, your policy's more strict, more restrictive than the federal policy, right? So you got to follow your own policy in that case. That's basically what this is saying. Having said that, okay, I'm giving a little pro tip. That's the kind of view of a lot of the current policies. The best current policies I've seen, okay, will be written to say that, for my local government entity, these are all the rules I follow every day of my funding, right? But, there's a little clause here. If I'm spending the federal funds, we're going to follow the federal rules, right? That covers you. You do that, and that's your best procurement policy. Okay, because then you can follow the federal thresholds. And a thousand dollars might be purchased to twenty thousand dollars SAT. Okay, I'm not saying you have to do this. I'm just recommending the best ones I've seen are to say you're going to follow the federal rules for federal purchase with federal funds. Okay? But if you don't do that. You got to follow your own local procedures if you're working with the federal rules. In a nutshell, that's what this paragraph said. That there's also some required clauses, contract clauses that are required to be in any kind of federal purchase. That's listed in here as well. Um, so there's certain clauses you have to require. That's in paragraph um, C, little two. I um, mentioned those. Um, 
And um, there's other requirements um, for conflict of interest, which is pretty self-evident, but basically, um, it, it should be an open government policy anyway. Like you can't, um, let's, let's just say you have a commissioner, a county commissioner who also has a business, right? Um, and the county commissioner is funneling grant money, public, right? You know, federal, federal purchases to his business, right? That's a conflict of interest. Even if you might think it's not really conflict of interest, it's a pure conflict of interest. Don't do it, right? It's going to create problems. You got to have an image of fairness for spending federal funds. So you can't be funneling these funds to people that have that, that are involved in that, that interest, you know, in their businesses. It, it could be the commissioner's wife or family member or relative, right? Don't buy stuff from that guy's businesses. You know, it's a conflict of interest, or it's going to be perceived as that. It's going to get you in trouble, all right? You have a director, a commissioner, anybody involved in If you're a grant manager, you own the business. Don't buy stuff from your own business for grant funds, right? It's going to create a problem. So that's essentially what conflict of interest is in a nutshell. You know, be fair, competitive, don't funnel money to the insiders, essentially, is what it's saying. Um, that should be, that's kind of a rule anyway, but that's also specifically for federal money. Um, Mini Brooks Act, this, um, it's in here, it's a requirement under North Carolina law, um, but, you know, it only applies to procurement for certain professional services performed by architects, engineers, surveyors, construction managers at risk. So if you're doing some kind of construction project, which hopefully you're not doing with this money, you have to put it here anyway, um, there's certain type of procurement you have to follow. It's called a qualification-based procurement, QBS, and it's really weird, but this kind of procurement is not based on necessarily the lowest price. It's based on the qualifications of the vendor, right? So you could have a vendor that provides one of these services that's more expensive than another vendor. You're supposed to select the most qualified vendor. Very weird. I think it's just some kind of lobby interest that these guys have. And we want to get as much money as we can from the state. Um, but that's essentially how this is. So if you're, if you're this limited professional service for the architects, engineers, and various production managers at risk, if you have any of that, Talk to us if you have any questions, but this is what this method is applies for. So I hope it doesn't affect you know, your So in a nutshell, that is the procurement stuff. I'm gonna pause and take any questions. We can get questions about procurement. Yes. So we have state contracts available to us to use that have been bid at the state level. Yeah. So if it has already been bid by the state yeah. and we're purchasing through that, we don't have any additional requirements to use this grant, do we? Should, should not. Yeah, should not have requirements. As long as those contracts are available, you should be able to use those, those contracts. How, how much? How much? How much? How much you purchase for the state? It's going to be less than hundred thousand dollars here, but is it going to be all your hundred thousand dollars going to go to purchase it, or it's going to be less than that amount, or how much you use the state contract? Only like equipment. Yeah. Oh, uh, about six. About sixty thousand. So, yeah, you should you should be fine on the state contract because it has a competitive bid on file that the state has right. state, done yeah, for us, yeah, which yeah, means exactly. we would not then bid again. I just yeah. want to be sure yeah. that would meet your requirements. That, that, that would be our that would be our requirements. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we would do that. What, what what's what's your local policy for point competitive bidding required? What what other job dollar is required for you? I don't have that in front of me. I'm okay. sorry to say I don't use it very often, but anything that is bid on the state level, unless we hit the maximum, we can use them without additional yeah, bidding because they've already competitively bid for the yeah. whole state. Yeah, you could. And what I'm getting at, though, is um, let's say your policy was for federal funds, we're going to use the federal guidelines to use the federal thresholds, right? That will be a simplified acquisition purchase, which would not even require full competition. So you'd be exceeding the requirements, right? So when in doubt, it's always good to use competitive bid, right? That's the safest thing to do. So we always encourage that. We're state contract in your case. That's a great idea to do that. Um, so I would tell people if you're in doubt, use competitive bid, it's just going to protect you. And I, I don't want to say something else about procurement, to be fair. Just because we pay it, we agree, it, that's fine, right? But you can get audited years down the road, right? And they could say, nah, we don't agree with that. You must have the So they're going to try to get that money. They're going to claw back that money from you, potentially, right? It's happened before, not to us, but I've seen it in other grant programs. So you gotta be really careful with procurement. So my advice, you know, again, if I'm, if I'm you, number one, I'm putting that clause in my procurement policy, so I have to follow better policy, right? And number two, if there's any question or any confusion, I'm gonna bid it out, right? The direct myself on it, or you should say the contract and anything else. All right, any other questions about procurement? I see anything online, all right. 
Moving on. Whew. Okay. Uh, the other thing about procurement, it's, it's in this paragraph B here. You can't do business with um, suspend your debarred vendors. Okay, so there is a um, there's a, a SAM, it's, it's, it's a federal government list, so we're using federal money. You got to go check SAM and make sure those folks are not debarred. But not to be one up, the state of North Carolina has their own department list. So um, you also got to check the state of North Carolina's department list as well. That's Derek, in this paragraph. Derek? Yep. In the chat, there was a question about sole sourcing. Okay. Requirement. Okay, yeah, for sole source. Um, yeah, so Lee, I think Lee has that question. Thanks for that question, Lee. I appreciate it. So, a couple layers to this question, Lee, okay? For sole source, number one, again, if you're at the micro purchase threshold level, hey, how much you're purchasing, all right? So, if you're less than the micro purchase threshold, you can sole source, right? Because that's what micro purchase is. One bid tells what votes all that's required, right? Going by. But depending how much you're spending, okay, it was, if it's below the micro purchase threshold, you're good. Again, that depends on what your local policy is. If you're following federal rules, the micro purchase threshold is ten thousand dollars or less. You may have a lower micro purchase threshold or small purchase threshold in your organization, which case you have to follow that. But if you're at that micro purchase or small purchase threshold, no competition required, one bid's enough. Okay. But let's say you are above that threshold. Okay, so as I see you're at the SIG by acquisition threshold between ten to three thousand dollars or by that, above that requiring full competitive uh, bidding. And then there are um, requirements in the federal regulations, and the regulations are linked in our MOA as well, um, where it'll say when a sole source is allowed, if competition were required, right? So again, if competition is not required, sole source is fine. But in those instances where competition is required due to the, due to the amount of the purchase, there are some exceptions that are allowed under federal law. Now, again, what's your local policy set? Okay, your local policy may say we allow sole sourcing under these particular provisions, right? But look at the federal rules. If you're following federal rules for sole sourcing, basically it's going to be under exigent or emergency circumstances. Okay, which for disaster grants that may apply, right? But for non-disaster grants, you guys going to apply? No, probably not, right? Just, that. Just because you might think. You need something really bad. That's not an emergency or exit for federal law purposes, so right? That's more like a disaster event. You know, we got to go to sole source. Something. So that is that. That's that's allowed for sole source. You got to justify that with the emergency or exit. And there are some other circumstances, some other outlines that we can talk about in more detail offline. Um, but for the most part, that's the big the big succession is the emergency or exit circumstance federal law. So yeah, okay, we yeah, hopefully any any other anything else follow up on. I have my hand raised there. Yeah. Um, just in consideration of everyone's time, we do have seven minutes left in this presentation. All right. Um, just letting you know. All right, let's move on. We're going we're to do the hard stuff, so we'll, we'll, we'll fly after that. Thank you. All right, so there's that. All right, so moving on. Let me share my screen again. Sorry. Okay, we talked about the bar vendors. Um, so there's all the information about that. We don't we don't do any indirect costs with this grant. We don't reverse any indirect costs. Only direct costs are reimbursed. The request for reimbursement process is here in G. Okay, this paragraph G, request for reimbursement process. So on page six, paragraph nine G, we have a lot of questions about that. This lays out the process for us. We've already talked about it ad nauseum. Um, but here's the email box you send your request for reimbursements to. Okay. Um, we ask that they be submitted no more than 60 days after payment of the invoice. Okay, so if you can do that, we ask for that. Um, and that's pretty much it for that. Now, the summary expenditure is in here as well. So please include a summary expenditure with your request for reimbursement. All right. Moving on, the taxes information is in paragraph H2. Again, we don't reimburse taxes. Talk about that. The documentation you're required to maintain in your grant file is in I, 6I. And this list here says that you have to add in your grant file. So if we ever ask to see your grant files, we're going to want to see all this stuff. Paragraph 6I. Property and equipment, 6J. This is an important paragraph. We had a question about earlier with the uh, inventory. Basically, if you buy something with federal grant money, if you buy equipment with federal grant money, okay, um, you've got to look at the value of that value. All right. First of all, if you buy federal grant money, you must inventory it and maintain it. You want it to appear to false to the grant. Okay. But the question we get is, can I keep 
after the grant's over. Right? That's a common question. And yes, if you buy some federal grant money, you can keep it. Okay. Now, when you go to dispose of that money, okay, this 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 exists beyond the performance of the grant. So it could be 10 years later when you go to, when you go to sell this piece of equipment. Okay. If the fair market value is less than five thousand dollars, there's no interest in the federal government that piece of property. You can do what you want with it. Okay. If the fair market value is five thousand dollars or more. You have to reach back out to us. We have to go back to FEMA and get disposition instructions because they retain the interest in that value. And they could say, well, if you sell it, we want our part of that money back, right? Whatever, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever you dispose of over five thousand dollars. They could say that. Have I seen them do that before? No. Could they do it? Yes. Most people will hold on to something until the fair market value is less than five thousand dollars, and they get rid of it. There's no, no, there's no problem. And the way you determine fair market value is in accordance with your own depreciation schedules. Okay. So, like vehicles comes up a lot. The, 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 the IRS schedules for a life cycle of vehicles five years for useful life. Okay. So, if you hold a vehicle for more than five years, it's going to be depreciated to a zero value. Then you go sell that and you'll keep the proceeds for it. That's what the question is about. So, I recommend to you with equipment, before you dispose of it, get that fair market value down to $5,000. If not, you've got to reach back out to us and you're small. We'll talk to you that way. That's what this guy really does in that show. Communications equipment in paragraph K. Certain communications of equipment has to be approved by our communications branch at NCM. There's an attachment four that talks about that. Um, it's very limited, but I would encourage you to read attachment four and see if your commission equipment falls within, falls within that. Um, conflict of interest in paragraph M. We've kind of covered this already. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about conflict of interest in there. EHP in paragraph N. Um, so if you are putting a nail in a wall, you need to shovel a dirt, teeth full of dirt, right? Rip it up carpet, dig in trenches, okay? Any disturbance of land, any disturbance of a structure, okay? Um, using federal grant money, EHP is required, okay? And the instructions are here. You have to do a certain EHP form, fill it out. Get it approved and cleared by FEMA before you start that project. Okay. So hopefully you're not in a situation where you're doing anything with like that, but if you are, CHP is required. That's what this paragraph says. All right. Moving on, there's some standard terms and conditions in paragraph Q. Um, but the big thing is close out reporting requirements, paragraph R. We talked about the documentation required here. So I mentioned close out already. So if you go to paragraph R on this one, uh, it talks about what's required for close out. So you follow up with your own MLA, page nine, paragraph R. This is what you have to do. Um, now, you have no later than 90 days after the pop to submit this documentation to us in paragraph R. Okay. So period form it ends 228-26. You've got 90 days to go ahead and submit this document to us, all this documentation to us. Okay. Then we'll review it. If we agree, we can do a site visit. Or not, we can ask to see your records or not. But once you get that final letter from us saying your grant's officially closed, you are done. That's your receipt and stuff. So if you were going to do a site visit, we would not have that congratulations letter yet. Yeah, we would wait. Yeah, you would get that after after the site visit. Yeah, after the third site visit. Yeah. And, and honestly, we'd like to do more site visits, which is not staff work. So you chance are you may not be paying for a site visit, but you know there are certain sub recipients that require higher level of monitoring due to their performance or audit issues, and we will visit those. So as long as you're just a Clean software stuff, no problems. You're probably not going to visit it, but come to visit it sometime. That's the way it works, basically. So, this is what you have to submit to us, and you get that letter from us, and you are done. It goes on here more about taxes in paragraph 10, um, reporting requirements in paragraph 12, and audit requirements in 13. So, reporting requirements, there are certain level of one to three reporting requirements in state law that you're required to file reports on funds you receive through state agencies. But it only applies to nonprofit organizations, not apply to government entities. So that they, you will not be subject to these requirements in paragraph 12 through government entity. Um, however, audit requirements, because you're, you're a local government entity, you're being audited in accordance with LGC requirements, local government commission requirements, or use annual audit. So for that, you must do your annual audit. Um, if you receive over 500000 if you receive over me, seven or thousand dollars or more in federal funding combined, you have to submit that audit to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse. That's what this paragraph 13 says. So not just this grant, but all sources of federal funding. If you receive $500,000 or more um, from a state agency, 
got to submit a copy to uh, DPS internal audit as well. That's essentially what this says. Um, so basically, you're going to be audited pretty much every year if you're a government. We can easily copy that audit. Um, that's pretty much it for that. And just to note, Derek, uh, we are at the 1130 mark. Okay. All right, appreciate that. Construction projects, if you have one of those, that paragraph 14 will apply for that. Um, hope we don't have that, but there's a lot of stuff with construction. Dave's Bacon, Build America, Buy America. If you have a left snow, we'll help, we'll help you with that. Sub-recipient monitoring is one of the attachments. Basically, says we have an obligation to monitor you and make sure you're following the rules. Um, if you don't, there are certain things that can happen to you if you don't follow the rules. So we mentioned that attachment. Um, public records access, um, essentially, um, our records we maintain for the grant are subject to North Carolina public records laws. So we could get public records requests for our grant files. We redact out any personal information or security information, and we have to release that information. That's what this basically says. So we try to protect all sensitive security information, all, all pertinent, you know, uh, PII, but somebody can make a records request for the grant files. It's really important with the law. People don't usually do that, uh, but it's possible. You know, occasionally we'll have a subrecipient who um, is involved in some funny business, and the press or media wants to investigate them, and they'll request grant files for you know, those 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 folks. Uh, so that's where it comes up usually. Um, a lot of this other stuff, honestly, is not going to come up every day, so I'm not going to go and bother and cover it. Um, civil rights compliance. You know, don't discriminate in the, in the application of these funds. You know, make sure these funds are used fairly um, without discrimination based on protected class. There's a whole bunch of stuff based on that. Um, what else we got here? All the other stuff is pretty much legalistic stuff. Um, par paragraph 33 is modifications. We talked about that earlier. So if you want to request a scope amendment or scope modification or a budget modification to your grant, contact us via email. And we'll let you know what you need to do from that point on. Um, paragraph 35 is all the nasty stuff that happens if you don't comply with the rules. So I'll go ahead and read that. Um, and then the list of attachments is paragraph 37. Okay. And then the last page is the signature page, which most people just go to that side. They can read the document. So you read the document, you're having everybody else. And that is our very quick overview of the MLA. Any questions? Any questions from the group? Okay. Let's see. Nothing in the chat? Okay. Seeing we no questions, yeah. Derek. Um, yeah. uh, we we do need to let folks know that we will be available later this afternoon for a question and answer session. Um, so look to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, do we are we taking a break scene or are we going into um, we're going to finish out okay. and give them time for questions. Okay. So, All right. we just had a break here. All right. So, is code next? Can we sit on the share documents? Do oh, do you have anything else you want to bring up? No, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the grant and thank everybody for participating. If you have any questions later this afternoon, we will be available. And if you have, if think of anything after uh, the sessions for today, feel free to reach out to your Direct Grants Manager or the SLCGP at NCDPS inbox for any programmatic question. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. All right. Do we have a huge yeah. All right. So now we're gonna have to, we're gonna test you all. Let's see if you're paying attention. <laughs> so online and in person here, we're gonna have a little quiz game here. Um, you gonna share your screen name on that? How's it going? Yes. All right. Stop sharing my screen, excuse me. <clears throat> You want to explain? Are you, are you explain how this works? Or am I doing it? Cool. Yeah, doesn't matter. You have the, the mic, so that might be better. Okay. So I know how this works. Um, is there's a link right there, Janine? Yes. There is a QR code. Can you scan that QR code with your phone, folks? And enter that game pin number in there. You're playing Kahoot before your kids will play Kahoot at school. Sometimes they do. So scan that QR code with your phone, open up that link, and we go with some folks that signed up here. 
And I apologize, we don't really have prizes, it's just bragging rights, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to prize when you have online people, you know, so can't figure that one out yet. Plus, we can't really use grant funds to buy prizes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so, folks, not going to sign up here. Yeah. But basically, the Hoots of Quiz game, you're going to have to be timed responses, so you're going to have to pick your choice for a certain amount of time. Quick, you answer the more points you get. It tallies your points up, and we'll see who wins at the end of the game. I think we only got what five or six questions, maybe. So it's yes. pretty real. And see who's paying attention. And I will say that your grant manager cannot assist you with these answers. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about yourself, so I'm going to you one among yourselves. We can't help you. Oh, uh, everybody in? No. No, no. I'm just in. Turning. You guys can do it as a team if you want, or individuals, however you want to do it. <clears throat> More than Mary. Right, we'll give one more minute. Oh. 37 we'll move forward. One more minute to get the folks done. <clears throat> one minute warning. Uh, girl geek get assigned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jane. Proceed for the coup. Here comes the question. Here comes the question. Get ready, folks. Get ready to answer the question. Quicker than that. Three, two, one. And CM manages 20 major recurring federal and state grants stolen. How much money each year? There's your choices 10 million, 100 million, 500 million, or 1 billion. <clears throat> Back to the very beginning of our presentation today. I didn't know if you promised to click on the Click, click on the color there. Yeah. Oh, I okay, know. All right, correct answer. 500 million. The majority of folks got it. A um, few folks did not. Some folks didn't even answer at all. But yeah, it's got to come down. You got to click on the You got to click on the orange picture answer. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you can go ahead and next step. Yeah. All right. So those who answered it fastest, uh, Nana S. Yes. Pretty quick on that thing. Nana's in the lead. Well, Fred Geek, Girl Geek's got to catch up here. Where's the most Girl Geek? <laughs> right, let's go ahead. Question two. The total amount of FY22 SLCG funding awarded to recipients in an NC is approximately the 22 SLCGP. One million, five million, ten million, one hundred million. Not twenty-three, but twenty-two SLCGP. <laughs> Two seconds left. All right, see the results. All right. <laughs> All right. So those who put ten million, that's the twenty-three program, right? The twenty-two program is five. And folks put one. Nobody picked 100 million. I wish it was 100 million. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we got the scoreboard. Boy, Nana S is still, still, still kicking out here. Right. <laughs> Kelly's right on, right on her heels. All right. In the grant life cycle, the stage after award letter is applications, reimbursement requests, reporting, or MOA grant agreements. You want to read it? That's true. Yeah. That's true. You want to read it? Oh, we are actually smart. Everybody tries that. Nice. Woo. 
And that's pretty timely because you're all doing your grant agreements, right? So it's very timely. Right. Right. See, we're actually the fastest stuff. That's going to be the most fun. Oh, oh man, it's so easy. They asked about Lee. Right. Making a little push. He's on the rise, but the arrow kind of up for Lee. <laughs> Kelly has the highest. This is pretty good for you. Yeah. Coming up. Don't, Kelly's on fire, but she's on fire. All right. <laughs> all right. Moving forward. An example of a proper electronic file naming convention. Oh, right. FY22 SLCGP is scan 123245. Do not pick that, please. <laughs> Bob Villa, Jonesbury County Cost Report, Jonesbury County Cost Report. Thank you. The answer is not scan 12345. All right, there we go. Most of us got Jonesbury County Cost Report. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, the answer wasn't bad, but but C was a little bad. All right, let's see the scores. Oh, oh, oh. Lee. Oh, oh, oh. Lee. JG is, 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 is still for it. Team 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 Ray Ray so I'm not here. All right. I think there's only two questions left, though, right? Well, all right, so you got two questions left. NCSR reporting period ends on what date each year? February 28, December 31st, October 1st, or June 1st. Ten seconds. Remember, it opened early this year. All right, February 28th. Most folks got it. Great job. <laughs> Let's see where we go. Lee, Lee, hold on, Kelly, Kendra, go fine. Where did Nana go? <laughs> <laughs> She's like that. We can talk, talk really fast, and then they kind of go down the stretch and slow down a little bit. All right, I think this would have one more. Last question. Last question. Which document is not not one of the five required documents? Sworn notarized overdue tax. IRS form W9. I try to commit vendor conflict of interest or procure policy. Again, the faster you answer, the more points you can get. Yeah, I'm kidding. It's so much. It's so much. All right. The majority of folks got it right. The IRS form. I mean, we want the stake of the not the IRS. So good job, majority of folks. <laughs> Let's see the final rankings here. The podium. Third, Kendra, third place. Kelly, second place. Yes, Anna, Anna. Who's <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you all for playing. All right. Thank you all for playing. Appreciate it. So now we have time for open QA. If anybody has any additional questions, we are here. Uh, we can be in the group. Let's see if anybody can check out. Yeah, I do nuts. Am I missing anything here, guys? Or is there any other questions? All right. I think with that, then, uh, we thank you all for your time. It's been fun, and we wish you the best of luck with this uh, grant. We hope we're going to get next year. We're going to thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to stop the recording, my folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.